Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Zero Day Threats, How to Get Ahead of the Attackers. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Coordinator at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of this presentation today. So before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, please make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's webcast is presented using a slide deck. You can cl click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge it. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It is the question mark icon on your console and covers co most common technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Lastly, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and a link to the slides. Also, you may earn a CPE credit for attending today. So now let's get on with the presentation. Our guest presenter today is Wendy Nather, Research Director at 451 Research. She is joined by Gajraj Singh, Product Marketing Director at Tripwire. Welcome to you both, Wendy and Gajraj. So without further delay, let's get on with the presentation. Wendy Nather will start us off. Take it away, Wendy. Thank you very much, Kate, and uh, many thanks to Tripwire for inviting me to, uh, to do this presentation with you. Um, I wanted to start by talking about, you know, in general, what the problem is. You, you probably know a lot about what the problem is, um, but just uh, as a refresher, first of all, um, the attacks are getting more sophisticated, and so they're harder to detect, they happen faster, and so on. And you know, you generally have limited resources to deal with these things, especially if you're just starting on an incident response program in your organization. Uh, my guess is that everybody there already has a full-time job, and so nobody is sitting around waiting to be able to use tools and, and investigate things full-time. So you're going to have limited resources anyway. Uh, we all know that. It's really a problem of scale. So how do you quickly focus your resources on the greatest risks to your most critical assets? That's assuming you know what the risks are and you understand at any given time through the information that's coming in which is most important to look at. And so that's another problem because there are a lot of fragmented tools. Um, one of the guys I work with, Garrett Becker, says that the security market is like a pomegranate. It looks like one big piece on the outside, and inside it's full of little seeds, and it gets really messy when you open it up. So uh, all of the tools you have are probably uh, fragmented, and there's not a lot of uh, – there are a lot of details, but there aren't a, a lot of context. And I'm sure you've heard that word context mentioned a lot before, and – my own definition of it may be different from others. Um, for example, if you get an IP address and you also learn that it's geolocated, let's say, in Switzerland, to me that's not context. That's a, an additional detail. The context is, hey, we're a city government in the U.S. We don't do business with Switzerland. That's the context, and that's what helps you decide how you're going to respond to that data that you have. So you need to bring some of the context yourself, but a lot of these security tools don't necessarily help you get there. So what, what you really need is um, information that will let you be confident in taking steps because, let's face it, sometimes when you think you have a breach, it can take a really long time to figure out whether you really do have one. So any external information or any tools that can help you become more confident uh, are going to help you a lot, help you with that context, and let you know whether there's other malware and there's other vulnerabilities that are associated with these threats. 
Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we at 451 Research have seen in terms of spending trends in threat intelligence. Uh, this is from uh, 2011 all the way to uh, current time. And as you can see, um, the red part on the left, which is uh, all of our commentators who say they already have threat intelligence, uh, that's gotten bigger over the years. And you can also see at the top uh, the very light blue segment, which is really people saying, yeah, we're going to try threat intelligence some point in the distant future. We don't really know when. That's sort of gone away over the years, and that's been replaced by uh, the darker blue segments that are more near-term uh, purchasing decisions. Now, you might notice that there's still a lot of enterprises that say that they're not buying threat intelligence. They don't have it in plan. The thing is, though, um, it, it's never really clear when we interview executives whether, first of all, they're defining threat intelligence the same way that we are, or whether they think that they say that they're not going to buy any because they think they already have it in the tools themselves that they already have. Um, so we do expect these numbers to, to go down. Uh, we do expect more users to be purchasing threat intelligence, but they have to be pretty clear first on you know, what e exactly it is. And again, you're going to hear a lot of discussion about threat intelligence um, and many different definitions in the industry. And I'll give you my definition here. First of all, it's really important that it provides data that you don't already have. So anything that offers to look at your current uh, activity, the current data you have, your logs, um, your network traffic, and then tell you what's going on, yes, you could call that intelligence, but I wouldn't call that threat intelligence. Um, telling you things about what you are seeing on your network, where they came from, what threat actors they might be, uh, giving you reputation scores on IPs that you've never seen before, uh, descriptions of attack tools. Um, you might see an artifact, and the threat intelligence will help you figure out that that is you know, something that belongs to an actual attack tool. So stuff that you didn't already know. And it should provide data that helps you make more decisions about defense. So it could be really short term, like we've seen this indicator, and they tend to go after this type of system, so we'd better go look at those other systems. Or it could be long term. It could be we know that these sort of threat actors tend to target our industry, and these are the methods that they use. So these are the things we should start thinking about getting in place um, you know, sooner rather than later to protect against those. So it could be strategic, it could be tactical, it could be both. And then finally, one other part of the definition for threat intelligence that I use is that the data has to be sold separately so that the customer can decide how to apply it. Um, otherwise, you have a very broad definition of threat intelligence so that even anything like signature or antivirus could be called threat intelligence because it's information about you know, some sort of attack um, being carried out through the use of malware or viruses. And, and so that's way too broad. Um, and we do see a lot of this already in most products anyway because they are supposed to have additional information that, that helps you use them properly. So again, the threat intelligence data should be sold separately and you should be able to apply it to more than just one product. You should be able to apply it you know, however you want across your enterprise. Um, here are some more attributes of threat intelligence. Um, first of all, in general, it's made to be collected. I know most enterprises who start with threat intelligence tend to get more than one feed or more than one source of intelligence. Um, and part of the value of that threat intelligence is that not everybody else knows it. Uh, if you took all the threat intelligence and you posted it you know, somewhere where everybody could get it, uh, nobody would want to pay for it. And the other th important thing, of course, is that the bad guys don't know that you have that information about them. Uh, it's also transitive. Uh, a, lot of this, uh, a lot of the threat intelligence that you will generally get has been shared by somebody else. 
and they've made decisions on what they're going to share, how much detail, and so on. And let's face it, a lot of this can be embarrassing information about enterprises getting attacked uh, and getting compromised, and they may not want people to know about it that broadly. So they may want to have their, um, the information that they contribute be anonymized at the very least. They may want to delay it until they've gotten the situation under control, and then they'll let you know that they've seen that attack, and so on. Um, and in a lot of cases, it really is person-to-person -person trust. Um, you might have a, a peer at another organization, and you're sending each other email, hey, are you seeing this? Yeah, we're seeing that too. But if your contact at the other organization leaves, you may not be that ready to trust their replacement. And so for that reason, this sort of threat intelligence can also quickly expire, it can degrade, it can dry up. Um, so that's the other thing you have to keep in mind. Now here are some key evaluation criteria that I'd like to propose. If you are thinking about buying threat intelligence, here are some of the things that you should ask about and that you should look at. This will also help you decide what type of threat intelligence is going to be the most useful to you. Uh, for example, you may want to ask the vendor where they're getting this data. Um, because I have seen some studies done uh, statistically on data feeds uh, from different sources and seen a lot of overlap, a lot of the same data coming in. For example, a lot of vendors all uh, access open source threat intelligence feeds because they're free and they're open. So a lot of that data you may already have for example. Um, ask them where they get it, whether they are deriving it themselves, whether they're licensing data from somewhere else. There are some vendors that like to aggregate lots of feeds. Uh, so talk to them about that. Uh, another one is variety. We tend to see a lot of vendors who are selling IP reputation blacklists, who are, are um, providing hashes of files, uh, and who are providing bad uh, URIs. And those are, are great if you have a set of those, but then there are some very interesting other types of threat intelligence that you can be collecting that may be much more relevant to you. And we'll, we'll get into that later. So you should find out what type of variety you're getting. You should find out uh, what the freshness is of this uh, threat intelligence. And by that I mean how often is it being updated? How fast are you getting this information from when it occurred? So remember I talked about uh, an organization that gets attacked and decides not to report on it or share that information until a week later. Um, you don't know exactly when an attack happened when it comes into your feed. You don't know how fresh it is. Um, how quickly is it being updated? Because if you're getting bad IPs from um, regular sites that have been compromised, hopefully they're going to clean them up really fast, and then you don't want those blacklists uh, in, in your feeds and in your systems. Now speed and scale I've put together, and again, you may talk with vendors who are all about how much data they are sending, how many millions of IOCs they're providing. Um, but the question is, first of all, where are they getting this information from? How widespread is it? Um, for example, if they have one source, some sensors in another country, that does not make it global data. So find out you know, how, how geographically distributed their sources are, how technically distributed. Um, and then, again, how fresh the data is, not just how fast they're delivering it to you, because they can do 10 gigabits a second or whatever, um, but is it really relevant to you? Is it, um, is it coming in faster than you can consume it? That sort of thing uh, you need to take into account when you're thinking about the speed of threat intelligence coming in. I just mentioned relevance, and if you don't care that there are universities in Amsterdam that are getting owned, um, then you probably don't want to pay for a feed that, that, that is that broad. And there are vendors who will trim it down for you to the types of data that you think are the most relevant to you. Um, false positive rate, again, 
sometimes false positives are in the eye of the beholder. Um, you may see some information and look at it and say, oh, no, we meant to do that. Or, yeah, we know that's a problem, but we can't get rid of it right now. Can we just put it off to the side? Um, keep reminding us that it's bad, but you know, don't, don't, uh, don't send an alert on it. Uh, there are all sorts of false positives um, that you need to be careful of in your threat intelligence feed. And actually, one of the most time-consuming activities when you're using threat intelligence is to figure out the false positives. Confidence, uh, again, you may get a lot of the same information from different sources, and that may tempt you to be more confident about it. Uh, but remember, again, that unless you know what, what the original sources are, it may just be that you are seeing the same false information three or four times. That doesn't mean you should have confidence in it. So think about that too when you're trying to decide how confident you are in this data and how confident the vendor is in the data. Um, completeness. This is a really hard thing to figure out. Uh, how do you know when you have enough threat intelligence data? How do you know when you've covered everything that you need to know about and you need to cover? Uh, I don't know. Let me know if you figure this one out um, because I, I know it's important, but I don't know of anybody who's been able to solve it yet. And then finally, consumability. This is a really big one. Um, are you going to take automated data and put it straight into another box? Uh, are you going to be dumping it into a Hadoop cluster and using Splunk to pull data back out of it? Um, are you going to have someone sitting there at a console and simply mining through the collected data? You need to decide how you're able to use it right now. Don't plan for the future and say, we're going to have a team of six and everybody's, you know, it's all going to be automated. If it isn't uh, available today, you probably shouldn't be spending ahead on threat intelligence that you can't actually use today. And then how to make the best use of threat intelligence in general. Um, first of all, there are a lot of automated attacks out there, as you know, and you really cannot keep up with them at human speed. You need automated defenses. So automate what you can and what you feel comfortable with. You may not feel comfortable with automated blocking, for example, but at the very least, um, collect, distill, filter, and alert on you know, whatever you can automate. And then the really subtle and complex data, narrowing it down after that is somebody that you, you're going to need a trained analyst for. Either that or you may want to outsource that to a vendor who has a lot of expertise in-house. Now let me mention quickly about something that I call cheeseburger risk management. Uh, this is sort of a, a widespread attitude, really, uh, among companies. It's sort of like if you consciously decide that you're going to keep eating cheeseburgers until your first heart attack, and then you're going to stop. And there are a lot of companies that really do have this conscious strategy of saying, we're going to wait until we have proof of the first attack, and then we'll get around to doing something about it because they really don't think it's going to happen, or they believe that it will happen, but they will save money in the meantime by not addressing it until it does. So keep that in mind. Threat intelligence can actually help you deal with that sort of attitude to say, well, the intelligence that we're getting indicates that um, you know, our neighborhood is the next to be hit. And so that may help deal with that sort of attitude. Now I'm going to pass things over to Gajraj to talk about other ways that you can use threat intelligence. Um, here you can see that, first of all, you can use it to perform a reality check, as I mentioned. Uh, you can make the best use of staff time and put the attacker on the defensive because of information asymmetry. Um, if you are, it, it used to be that we would all talk about you know, you, your defenses had to be perfect, and you only had to mess up once, and then you could get successfully attacked. But with threat intelligence, that flips the information over on its head, because if we all share threat intelligence, and the attacker messes up once, 
and somebody sees it, they can share that information and now that attacker can't use that tactic anymore. So they have to be careful now. They, they only have to mess up once for everybody to know about it. So let me pass this over to Gajraj and, uh, to talk about the different types of security intelligence. Thank you, Wendy, uh, that, you know, sh for sharing you know, your research and insight and some of the you know, criteria and how to select and how to consume you know, threat intelligence information available and you know, find what is relevant for the organization at a given point in time and how to best make use of it. So you know, I'm going to talk about some of the solutions that Tripwire is putting together. Uh, and you know, uh, the idea is to help in the audience here, attendees here, understand uh, how some of it is relevant to the, the guidance and the you know the research that you shared with us just now. So again, uh, thank you everybody for attending and making the time to join us today uh, at Tripwire. You know, we look at a broad range of uh, real-time security intelligence and analysis uh, technology and tools. And how do we combine them together in an integrated and an automated manner? Uh, the idea being, you know, to eventually help you, uh, you know, detect and respond faster to some of these indicators of, you know, not just compromise but even breach and vulnerability. So there's there's four broad areas that we look at in you know, the log and even intelligence. I think that's a given. Uh, including some of the tools that Tripwire provides in our Tripwire Log Center. Uh, that's a critical part of any threat protection you know, uh, framework or deployment. And it needs to include both network and endpoint uh, information and analysis. Uh, it also provides you, know, you a, security, a set of security event and log collection mechanisms, but also tools for things like you know, threat analytics and forensics and compliance. Uh, so it becomes part of integral part of any you know, threat protection solution, and then endpoint intelligence, you know, uh, such as what Tripwire Enterprise enables, includes uh, really or needs to include, you know, uh, we, you know, Tripwire Enterprise does, but any other endpoint intelligence solution that you're using needs to include uh, really high fidelity system state and file integrity data. And any change that is happening in the system state configuration or the files on those systems, uh, and when I say systems, I'm meaning a broad range of endpoints, uh, servers, and even network platforms that may be part of your, your IT uh, ecosystem. And it builds upon, you know, uh, at Tripwire, it builds upon our robust, proven, you know, real-time change detection technology, which has been around for more than 10 years, uh, that's been trusted by you know, over half of the Fortune 500, uh, and it's deployed across a million uh, critical servers. So it's a proven technology that we are leveraging. And then vulnerability intelligence, you know, that is based upon uh, integration of our vulnerability management system and also the configuration management system. So we are integrating those two, the idea being to help quickly focus uh, the remediation efforts on, you know, what Wendy said earlier, uh, greatest risks to your most critical assets. So vulnerability intelligence integration really helps the analyst quickly detect and respond to potential threats uh, based upon the vulnerability and risk assessment that your vulnerability intelligence uh, provides. And then uh, once you have that information, then the, because it's integrated with the configuration management system, in our case, uh, the you know, IP360 integrated with Tripwire Enterprise, you can then you know, decide to harden the critical systems that appear to be at higher risk. Uh, either you can you can do it manually, or you can automate that as well. Uh, in our solution, you can automate and trigger some of the automated responses. But then again, as uh, you know, Wendy suggested, that's a decision you can make, and you have to make as to you know, do you want to do it manually? Do you want to analyze and then trigger some of those uh, automated mechanisms, or some of the systems that may be you know remote? and maybe remotely exploitable, you might want to take an automated action there. And last but not the least, you know, the topic of today is threat intelligence. You know, how does threat intelligence you know, figure in this entire framework? So at Tripwire, the approach we are taking is an open architecture approach with APIs and frameworks uh, you know, using standards such as STIX, Taxi, and Cybox. Uh, so that you can, you know, essentially leverage a variety of intelligence sources 
that best fit your needs, uh, your industry, the kind of uh, IT environment that you have, and the regions that you might be in. So, you know, all of the different, you know, criteria that Wendy talked about, you know, take those into consideration, make the best choice that best fits your needs, and we're giving you those choices. Okay? So that way, that way, you know, you can get the best of breed uh, from our partner integrations. We have multiple of partner integrations that we have recently announced and more that we are going to be continuing to announce, uh, you know, in, in the near future. So the, the idea is, you know, we want to help customers detect, analyze, and verify advanced threats, even zero-day threats, right? So the topic that we put today was, you know, how does threat intelligence become relevant to zero-day? And, and this is exactly, you know, what this, what this solution is intended to do, not only help you find known attacks because, you know, that's about probably half of it, right? I mean, these statistics are out there that, you know, 51% of the, you know, uh, legacy systems are not even able to find or detect the zero-day attacks. So, you know, therefore, that's only half as relevant. More relevant is the millions of zero-day and variants of zero-day attacks that are threats that are coming in and advanced persistent threats. So this solution helps you, you know, get that. And it's designed to support both cloud and on-premises based threat intelligence platforms. So again, gives you, you know, full flexibility. Next, I want to talk about, you know, what's the value that we deliver to you, right? So broadly, again, you know, it's not an exclusive, you know, all-inclusive, but just, you know, a broad categorization of some of the values that this system is expected to deliver. So with these new innovations in the area of security and more specifically threat intelligence integrations, uh, we, uh, we are thinking our customers can now benefit from <clears throat> this highly granular threat analytics and forensics capabilities, uh, but also have the ability to quickly now detect and respond to many of the advanced threats. Uh, the solution enables threat analytics to quickly you know, detect emerging threats and breach activities with very high precision and confidence, uh, and also quickly investigate you know, the full scope and impact of these threats. So sometimes when a breach has occurred, it's important to quickly be able to scope it so that you can limit the, the losses and the damages that might you know, uh, occur as a consequence of that breach. And then the, the, the threat detection, you know, so Tripwire Enterprise has uh, I talked about earlier, you know, the ability to detect anomalous, you know, system and file changes and provide, you know, early indicators of threat or, or, or a breach. Uh, and if a targeted attack occurs, you know, we have some, you know, built-in out-of-the-box cybercrime controls uh, that can help you detect some of the, uh, some of those targeted attacks that are known. Uh, but in addition now, with the threat intelligence, you know, partnerships, uh, Tripwire Enterprise can definitely help you, definitely, you know, help you detect and analyze, uh, but also verify both known and, and advanced threats. So that's, that's the new part here, is that now you can not only see anomalous changes, but you can actually find out, hey, is this a real, real threat? Is this something that, you know, one of my threat intelligence services that I am, you know, using is telling us with high confidence that there is actually a, uh, it's not a benign chain, or it's not a benign file. So you get that additional, you know, threat intelligence here. Uh, and then forensics. Uh, in addition to, you know, the endpoint and network security information that log management systems have, uh, now the endpoint intelligence, you know, uh, from Tripwire Enterprise, in, that it maintains a complete history of endpoint and file changes. So you can go back and look at the information, right? Uh, so the value of that is, you know, based on the latest threat intelligence update, uh, you can now confidently, you know, go back and look and answer the question, if you've already been uh, infected with a, if you've already been infected with a, uh, uh, you know, with, with a malware that's just been detected, and if so, for, for how long, right, and on what systems. So, uh, you know, uh, that, and then investigate, uh, Further, you know, uh, uh, further information behind that. You know, who made those changes? You know, what what changes occurred on the systems that are showing some of these uh, some of these signs? And are there any other associated, uh, you know, threats that are uh, attached to it or activities? You know, which may give you deeper insight 
into uh, you know what may be coming uh, in in future near future. So so that's important also to to understand. And then uh, you know eventually you want to be able to respond right, and you want to be able to respond quickly. So empowered by you know all these detection analytics and forensics. Uh, you can then much more, you know, uh, precisely respond to those threats. And again, you know, as, as Wendy was was guiding us, uh, that's a decision we need to make in, you know, in the in the, in the context of your environment and, and the, the the assets that might have might be impacted, you know, with a given given threat. So that's where the information, you know, such as business context come into play, and Tripwire, you know, uh, has that built in where you can uh, assign business value and business, uh, you know, score to to certain assets. So it'll tell you, you know, are these the critical assets? Are critical assets being impacted by this particular threat that you just learned about? And therefore, what is an appropriate action for you uh, to make? Uh, do you want to automate that, or do you want to take, you know, do it manually? Uh, and to what degree do you want to go? Is it just a monitoring change? Uh, do you want to scan for more information? Do you want to investigate further using the analytics tools, or do you want to start, you know, making a making a maybe a protective action right away? Uh, so next, you know, I want to look at a few examples, uh, a couple of examples of, you know, uh, some of these threat intelligence integrations and and how. Uh, you can benefit today uh, from what Tripwire is already delivering. So it's not something in future. This is you know things that you can use today. So the first is you know a advanced uh, malware threat detection use case, if you would. Right. So this is when we see uh, binaries change uh, on end endpoint systems, right, or if they are behaving in a suspicious way, yeah. and that's when you know Tripwire Enterprise. Uh, is monitoring you know all the files on your uh, critical systems. Uh, also, if any new file comes onto the systems, and when such a suspicious file is detected, we can then send it to a threat intelligence service. Again, you know you've made that choice, right? So you've chosen uh, the, the threat intelligence service that is the best you know suited for your needs, and then Tripwire Enterprise can send that file information or the complete file to that threat intelligence partner. Uh, the threat intelligence, you know, service then analyzes the file and the information that uh, Tripwire has provided, and it will come back with a uh, with a response, whether you know, with analysis that uh, is the file a benign file or is it a is it a is it a threat? Uh, it may be a known threat. It may also be a new zero day threat, right? So once we know that, Tripwire Enterprise can then you know uh, you know. Uh, come into action and provide you all of the benefits of the built-in workflows and processes to, to for you to drive uh, remediation uh, based on the properties that you may have already set. But also, the information you know from the malicious file and its behavior now becomes part of that threat intelligence service database. So you know, Wendy spoke about you know uh, the information asymmetry. And this is a way for us as defenders of our IT systems to, you know, uh, turn that asymmetry in our favor, where we may, you know, the, the hacker only needs to trip once. We just need to, only one of us needs to find that new zero day, and then it's not zero day anymore, right? So with this advanced threat detection, you know, uh, capability in this use case, uh, what do you get? You get real-time uh, file monitoring to quickly detect any uh, any known or any new malware or malicious uh, change. Uh, you get support for multiple threat intelligence services giving you the, the choice to make. And you get automated analysis. You can automate this, uh, you know, this whole file analysis you know, uh, mechanism and the, the process of update, uploading the information to the threat intelligence you know, service provider and then getting that information and making, taking you know, uh, actions uh, depending on you know, what makes best uh, uh, decision choice for for your systems. Uh, solution helps you, you know, identify known and, and also zero day, as I mentioned earlier. But now uh, the critical point is also that it helps you now overcome that information asymmetry that the hackers had. Now we have an ability of leveraging that in our in our in our favor. The next use case or you know example that I wanted to take is you know the advanced threat monitoring to reduce uh, you know attack surface and that's 
that's our goal, right? We want to keep reducing our attack surface so that we are more and more secure uh, over a period of time. And we've done integrations with you know many of the uh, names that you might be familiar with here, uh, Soltra, Hi-Fi Partners, uh, CloudStrike. And so with, you know, with Tripwire, uh, you can take in uh, peer and community source indicators from some of these sources, uh, leveraging, again, what I mentioned earlier, the open architecture with sticks and taxi, uh, or through you know, some tailored high-end commercial uh, threat intelligence uh, services that are also available. So automated threat monitoring now can proactively identify uh, indicators of advanced threat and targeted attacks, or you know, what is commonly known as indicators of compromise. Uh, so IOCs are, in this case, automatically downloaded to Tripwire Enterprise from the threat intelligence service. And, and then uh, Tripwire Enterprise will search its security data to see if you know, it's already seen an instance of that IOC. Uh, so that is a look back. You know, you, you have, because we have the information uh, available in the system, we can go and look back and search if you've already had that uh, particular threat. Uh, and, and we just didn't know about it because that information wasn't definitely available uh, to us. And we now an external, you know, source, uh, i.e. Uh, threat intelligence service as you know, given us that, that critical information which has told us that this could be a, you know, threat or a potential, uh, uh, you know, cause for a breach. So, so now you have the IOC comparison uh, going on. And Tripwire will then start, you know, monitoring for this indicator and also any, any new system changes. So it will it'll not only look back, but it will keep that, that information and start looking for it as new changes occur on any of your systems. And if a threat is indicated, you will uh, get you can get immediately alerted, or any other workflow that you want to want to trigger off uh, as a part of your remediation process or investigation process. So with this threat monitoring uh, in example, uh, what you get is access to a uh, you know set of global network of uh, leading security technologies, uh, leveraging our standards-based integration. Uh, support for industry-specific threat identification is another big benefit out of this. Uh, so you can choose what is best suited for your industry and your environment. Uh, example, uh, you know, uh, FSI SAC uh, for financial industry. You know, Soltra actually collaborates and you know, uh, provides that excellent information there. Uh, automated analysis, just as in the previous case, so that's still there and helps you prioritize. We have the business context information, also the risk information. So it will help you prioritize quickly and accelerate your time to, to remediation. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, fast identification of potentially compromised assets, so, which you did not know before. So now you can quickly accelerate uh, the time to, you know, uh, to, to address some of the possible exploits and potential exfiltration which might occur as a consequence of your, some of your assets that have been compromised by a, a, a IOC that you just learned about. So you can now uh, continuously, you know, uh, through this process, uh, you know, reduce the, the, the avenues for compromise. And that's what we are calling as the, you know, the sum total of that is, of course, the attack surface. So you want to reduce the attack surface uh, and, you know, have it, this asymmetric information advantage uh, going back to, you know, one of Wendy's, one of Wendy's uh, guidance points saying uh, this could be a, a big benefit out of this, this uh, is the, this the new technology integrations? So, you know, how does it all come together? You know, for us, uh, as we think as you know, technologists and solution providers, we want to make this easier for you uh, and also provide this as a, as a more comprehensive uh, solution. So, you know, we think the solution to this is this uh, you know this unprecedented cyber threat problem that both businesses and government organizations are facing. Is, is what we are you know, uh, putting together as an adaptive threat protection solution, uh, which can provide dynamic threat and asset context uh, with, within this integration and, and automation framework. So adaptive threat protection to us, uh, and hopefully you agree, is the, is the next generation uh, of a threat protection solution. Right? That's what we need to do, and, and that's what Tripwire is, is putting together to reduce this overall cyber threat gap. 
enable you to quickly detect and respond to advanced threats. Uh, it, it, it will it's based upon and leverages multiple sources of security intelligence, not just threat intelligence, but also some of the information that you have within your network and uh, how does that, how, do, how can you integrate that and automate some of those, uh, some of those information uh, sources together? How do you combine them together in an integrated and an automated manner? So it's based upon this real-time intelligence and analysis from uh, login event, endpoint, and vulnerability combined together with the threat intelligence. And then uh, what it delivers to you, uh, you know, critical again, is, you know, the, the value in within the high granularity threat analytics that it enables, uh, forensics that it enables. And then, you know, eventually you want to be able to, you know, detect zero-day threats, but also be able to uh, respond to those threats. And, and that's the real value of this adaptive threat protection uh, that Tripwire is proposing. And uh, we've done a, a you know, s a sequence of work here uh, with the partnerships, some of the integrations within our own portfolio, and deepening the endpoint intelligence and log human intelligence uh, so that you can use this solution today. So the key point here is this isn't anything in the future. You know, of course, we will continue to develop. But the solution is available today for you to use, and we integrate with a with a variety of you know uh, partners on the right hand side, uh, also in the security analytics, forensics, and SIM, and, and threat response space. So you'll find on our on our website if you go there, you'll find a number of you know uh, threat solutions, analytic solutions, and SIM, uh, and other monitoring and reporting. Uh, solutions that we integrate with that you may already have in your in your system. So that's rich information and threat context and analysis that is available from adaptive threat protection can be leveraged by those third party, you know, the other source, other uh, partner solutions that we integrate with. So uh, that's pretty much what I have to share today. Uh, again, I want to thank you uh, very much for attending, you know, uh, this webinar today. And with that, I want to turn it back to Wendy and take up some of the questions that you have uh, and uh, you know, uh, conclude the session. Thank you. Wendy? Okay. Thank you, Gajaj. Um, a lot of really good information there. I'm going to open up the questions now. Uh, please don't be shy. Go ahead and click on that Q&A tab on your screen and, uh, and go ahead and, and put something in there. One of the first ones that we got, let me um, – send this across to you, Gajraj, I think this is for you. How do you identify unknown threats other than using some behavioral techniques? Unknown threats are, you know, primarily in the, in the same uh, zone of zero day where, you know, w typically they will have some, you know, uh, mechanisms within the endpoint systems. Uh, or they are going to be using some kind of a malicious, you know, uh, malicious program. Uh, so the malicious program is what we can, you know, uh, share with the threat intelligence, you know, service, and then they will either uh, have maybe, you know, if you get lucky, maybe somebody else has found it at the same time, and it's just, you know, uh, being converted from a unknown to a to a zero day, uh, or uh, this may be, be the first instance of that unknown threat, uh, being unknown even to the threat intelligence, uh, you know, uh, service provider. And then they will take this file and detonate it, you know, basically uh, deploy it in, in their sandboxing technology, uh, you know, and then analyze over there and then not only provide information about, you know, hey, yes, this is a, this is a threat or not a threat, but a, a number of you know threat intelligence uh, providers can actually give much more detailed information, you know, meta tags and other indicators of compromise associated with it. Uh, you know, one of the examples is last line, where they uh, they actually provide even associated uh, you know threat information. What we have seen, so when you talked about IP reputation, you know, so the same source, sometimes the same uh, source has, you know, multiple uh, threats going on. And you can quickly see that it's, this is only one instance you found. There are four others that, you know, already have been discovered. And they're associated with this zero day. 
Great, thank you. And um, I, it, along with the, that, I'd add that uh, some of the vendors that are working on identifying unknown threats um, are really working on trying to figure out if there are threats, uh, you know, over over time. So, for example, if you have a preponderance of, of evidence um, of things that you are learning about the threat that don't look good, um, for example, this uh, you know this IP address is associated with a domain that's less than two hours old. Um, I know of one organization that just basically blocks traffic from any domain that's that's less than two days old, and they they block a lot of threats that way. Um, or this particular entity has been associated with some other IPs that um, have been assigned bad reputations. In other words, it's got some pretty sketchy friends. Um, not just the behavior, but also um, where where it might be coming from. If if the uh, geolocation translates back to a very sparsely populated area, but you're seeing a whole lot of traffic that really shouldn't be coming from that area. Um, those sorts of things can also be used to help identify a threat. Uh, and a lot of those things um, come together in an in indicator of compromise or an IOC where it's basically a long list of things uh, associated with that particular threat that can be anything from behavior to uh, particular file contents or hashes uh, or associated reputation. Um, uh, all sorts of things. They're still working on those standards. Um, here's another question for you, Gautraj. Uh Does the endpoint intelligence also take into account mobile devices? Y yes. Uh, so, you know, first of all, you what you want to make sure is that your critical assets are covered, and then you know all the other uh, not so critical. I mean, everything is critical once you have it. Once you have a threat coming in. Uh, but yes, in in broad uh, you know definition, mobile devices uh, you know need to be covered there. Even cloud instances need to be covered. I would say so. It's it is the extended enterprise that needs to be covered. We have coverage on you know many of the assets, and you know some of the information will come from again. Uh, we may not have that endpoint intelligence. We may come from a partner. It may come from other sources. So you remember I spoke about you know log intelligence being part of that uh, part of that you know that that framework and some of that information about peripheral devices even partner devices may come through the event uh, intelligence uh, you know information source. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one is how long does Tripwire ATP need to be resident in the network? To begin to identify anomalous behavior from endpoint intelligence. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is uh, you know, uh, more time it has spent, uh, the more state information you would have. So there were uh, you know a number of things that I was uh, talking about, where you may you know if you have if the system has been in place for a while. Uh, and you've gathered endpoint intelligence, you know, history, then you would have the benefit of being able to look back at that information, right? But you know, the system basically kicks into gear uh, right away. Uh, you know, so vulnerability intelligence. You know, as soon as you have one, you know, complete scan of your uh, of your network, you would have that information available. And then you correlate that information with your with your asset view in the Tripwire Enterprise, and you can start correlating, you know, uh, where is the greatest risk on some of your most critical assets. So you can start getting that, but the look back requires some of that history. Uh, so, you know, more more the better, but it is not that you you need a certain minimum time before you can you can start uh, getting the benefit out of it. You can get it right away. Okay, great. And then uh, here's one that I really like. Um, what kind of IOC or indicator of compromise would you recommend sharing publicly, or just in closed groups, so that attackers don't know the detection methods? Uh, yeah. So you know, IOCs uh, don't necessarily give away detection methods. Uh, so specific pieces of intelligence may you know have source and methods. 
uh, and then you need to determine you know risk like, to your intelligence sources before you share uh, you know it outside. However, in most cases, you know especially if you were trying to combat an opponent uh, that has launched or you know is already attacking your network, uh, they probably you know assume that you can capture anything that that they're going to deploy. So if you're, ex if you're using external sources of intelligence, the situation becomes a little bit more complex, uh, uh, and that's where you know it, it helps to have experienced and a trained staff uh, that can make the appropriate decision. The you know, I mean, at the end of the day, the risk tolerance uh, you know for each organization is going to be different. Uh, so it'll likely be something that you know uh, you will you will you know make custom or tailored decision. Uh, based on your organization risk, the you know kind of industry you're in uh, and the kind of sector you may be in, uh, you know there are certain sectors that we have seen are coming on more under attack versus others. So you know I think those are some of the uh, elements that you need to consider uh, when you make that decision. You know how widely do you want to share that information? But you know sharing amongst peers we have seen I think is probably the most uh, trustworthy and when you you spoke about that that you know you have trust relationships within uh, with, with your peers and it's, it's always a good idea to you know have that trust circle of trust where you can share this information if others are seeing it uh, again turning that uh, information asymmetry in your favor is a good idea okay great um, I think that is all the questions um, let me just add here our contact information in case you have any other questions um, that you'd like to send along. And uh, with that, I will hand things back to Kate to close out the session. Thank you so much, Wendy. I'd like to thank you for being on our webcast today. Um, that was uh, Wendy Whitnather from 451 Research. And thank you so much, Gajra Singh from Tripwire. And thank you to you, our audience today, for joining us, and we hope you did enjoy the presentation. As I mentioned at the beginning, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand webcast and a link to the slides as well. And when you reply to that email, if you're interested, you may earn a CPE credit for attending today. So with that, we hope you enjoyed today's webcast and that you will join us for future webcasts. If you check out tripwire.com, you'll uh, see a list of all our upcoming events. And also check out our blog, State of Security. Again, thank you, and have a great day.